there is a first time for everything. I was sent a copy of the Software Developer's Guide to Linux for review, and review it, we shall do. Now, full disclosure, whilst this was sent to me by the publisher Pact Publishing, everything I say here is my own opinion. I have not been paid to do this coverage, and they probably wouldn't want to pay me for it anyway, because you'll see why in just a bit. This book was authored by two people, David Cohen and Christian Stern. David Cohen is a 15-year system administrator and also the owner of the Tutorial Linux YouTube channel, and Christian Stern is a consultant on software and systems architecture. Now, the book itself is broken down into 17 chapters, covering topics like what is a process, how to interact with processes, listing out processes, things of that nature, what the command line is, how to interact with the command line, common tools you'll be using on the command line, pipes and other things that you probably should be knowing, how to edit files from the command line, common tools you might want to be using, and system management of users and groups alongside basic stuff on how to interact with systemd. It aims to basically give you a, how would I say it, like a head start into using Linux, but skipping a lot of those I guess historical details and details that don't really matter. It assumes that you are a software developer and you've been given this Linux system that you need to write code for. You are using this as a development environment. You don't care about all that stuff in the background, but you do need to know how to actually use it. And not just use it, but use it in an effective way that takes advantage of the fact that you are using a Unix-like system pipes and shell scripting and bash and all of these incredible things, not focusing on the specific Dester environment that you might find yourself in, but focusing on those things that every system is going to have. Generally, each chapter starts with a fairly quick introduction to the topic, just in case the reader has absolutely no idea what's going on, and then very quickly gets into the things that you're actually reading this for, like how to use this tooling, the tooling you're going to be using, all of that sort of stuff, with a lot of the chapters ending in a real-world problem. Like, this is a way that you can use this tooling to solve this particular issue. But the important question that's going to decide on whether you actually buy this book or not is whether it can do this consistently and do this in a concise and sensible manner. Let's start digging into the positive before we get to the negative. For anyone new who may just be coming across this channel for the first time, I've been daily driving Arch Linux for about five years now, and I've been running this channel for about as long as well. I've constantly been talking about things that have been happening in the Linux space, and whilst I don't dig into things like kernel development at a deep level, I have a good general understanding of most of the Linux world with certain areas like Wayland that I've dived into a lot more than others. I went into this book with zero expectations, not negative expectations, but I just expected, oh, it's going to be general copy and paste Linux stuff. There's not really going to be anything of value here. But I was pleasantly surprised that I actually did learn some new things. For example, most of you probably know about the which command. This is used to tell you the path of an application. But did you know about the POSIX alternative, command-v? This does pretty much the exact same thing. In some cases, the formatting is a little bit different. For example, if we do command-v on an alias like my ls alias, it's going to look a little bit different than doing it over here. But it achieves the same goal. Or how about NetHogs? This is an application that indicates which processes are used in the internet and how much bandwidth they're actually using. There was also a really good explanation of the numbers used in Chmod and how if you take the number for read and the number for write and then add those numbers together, you actually get the number for read write. If you take the number for read and the number for execute, add those together, now you get read and execute. The numbering is perfectly ordered. On page 110, it suggested using the slash temp directory, which is frequently cleaned out by the system, for throwaway builds. So if you want to just compile some code, no need to worry about just deleting it yourself. Just do it from the temp directory and the system will just delete it for you. And also a command that I've never used before, the logger command, which is a command that lets you just write things into your system log. I don't know when I would use this, but it is nice to know about. 
along with things that I feel like everybody should be aware about. Like if you run exclamation mark command, it'll run that command using the options from the last time you used it. So if you want to SSH into the same server over and over again, you don't have to write out all of the additional options. You can just do exclamation mark SSH or the fact that you can run sudo exclamation mark exclamation mark to rerun the previous command, but with sudo. The fact that there are better versions of grep. Grep is really slow, but there are re-implementations like RG, rip grep, and AG, silver searcher, which are considerably faster and really matter on big files. On both page 108 and 141, it goes over curl piping into bash and curl piping into sudo bash and basically is like, don't do this, download the file, read the file, and then execute it. Please stop piping things from the internet into bash, it is really dangerous. On page 132, there is a great explanation of how output redirection works. Combining that with what you learn in the pipe section, which basically indicates, hey, yes you can pipe a thousand commands together, but Please think about the next person that needs to read this command. Maybe split it up into variables. And in the Git chapter on page 196, there is an explanation of how to write a Git message. Don't just say, oh, this is what we did. The code says that. Explain why you are making a change. I said this countless times and I'll keep saying it again and again. However, I do have some concerns with some of the content in the book. For example, this on the title says, Developer's Guide to Linux. Now, nobody else besides a giant nerd is going to notice this, but on page 17, page 118, and page 120, where they show a man page, it's not the GNU man page, it's the man page from FreeBSD, which is the man page used on macOS. Is it that difficult to get a Linux man page for the Linux book? And regarding macOS, it makes a mistake about that as well. On page 5, it talks about how ZSH is used by systems where people start making modifications to them, but doesn't mention that on macOS, ZSH is the default now. Also on page 104, where it mentions a bunch of package managers, Homebrew is the first one listed. Now Homebrew is available on Linux, but Homebrew is not a popular option on Linux. Your system package manager is going to be the main one. And it does mention a couple of options here, but doesn't mention DNF or Zipper, but for some reason mentions Pac-Man. Now I understand not mentioning Gentoo, totally fair. This is about professionals, but not mentioning the package manager used on SUSE and Red Hat doesn't make any sense. And this might just be a nitpick, but on page 216 when talking about virtual machines, it says Linux, Windows, and its example for BSD virtual machines is Dragonfly BSD. Now, it doesn't matter. I would have said something like FreeBSD, OpenBSD, or NetBSD, but why Dragonfly BSD? This also might feel like a nitpick, but I don't know why chapter 17 exists. It's all about HTTP, status codes, all of that stuff that is great to know, and it's good information. But why is it in a book titled The Software Developer's Guide to Linux? If it's a book about web development or server management or Linux from the server side, that makes sense, but that's not what the rest of the book's been about. It felt like the author included that to hit some sort of page limit the publisher was looking for. With that being said, there's no final word. The author doesn't wrap up the book, it just ends, and then the next page is the publisher just recommending other books they've published. I would have liked to see the author recommend other reading that they would like you to check out, maybe, you know, go check out the Arch Wiki and things like that, which is mentioned at prior points in the book. It just felt like a weird way to conclude everything. My major issue with chapter 17 is there are other really good parts of the book that I would have loved to see expanded upon. On page 10 when it's talking about paths, it doesn't mention the existence of Tilda for accessing a home but it had mentioned it at a previous point and had been using it in one of the examples. On page 39, it talks about systemd services, but doesn't talk about user services. There is no mention of user services throughout the entire book. On page 46, there is no mention of your Z profile and ZSH emp when configuring ZSH. On page 80, when talking about text editors, it talks about nano, it talks about vim, 
but there is no mention of Emacs. Now, obviously you can't go deep into Emacs, but there's no mention of it even existing on page 100. It talks about doing a recursive to own, which I think is incredibly dangerous, but it makes no mention of the fact that you can destroy your entire system by doing this. On page 109, there is no mention of git pulling. On page 122, there is no mention of the fact that, yes, configs do commonly exist in the .config directory, but a lot of applications will litter your home directory as well. On page 123, when it goes into how to actually make a systemd unit file, there is very little detail about making the file. The example is basically, hey, here's a complete file, just copy this. It barely explains what any of the variables in the file actually do. Now we get into the simply legitimate mistakes. On page 30, there's a mention of opening up the man page for signals, you know, sig term, sig int, things like that. What it fails to mention is that on some distros like Arch Linux, this man page is in a completely separate package that you've probably never installed before. You might say this is not that big of a deal and maybe it's there on Ubuntu and it doesn't really matter. Fine. On page 84, it talks about the sudo as group being the group that administrators are in and then on macOS, they use the wheel group. Now, sudo as is not a group. There is no sudo as group. There is the etsy slash sudo as file, and on Debian-based systems, if you have sudo writes, you are in the sudo group. Now, sudo is not the normal on Linux, it's just a Debianism. On pretty much every other system, it's the wheel group. On page 87, it talks about permission control being the previous chapter, but it's not, it's the following chapter. On page 103, it says that most distributions use TLS for their repos. I would like that to be true, but it's not. Ubuntu, for example, by default, on most of their repos, still does not use TLS, does not use HTTPS. On Arch Linux, it's exactly the same, and on a bunch of other distros, they don't use TLS all the time. On page 106, when talking about package managers, with the example of how to install an application with Pacman, it uses a command that you should never run. Pacman capital S Y. This is going to install a package and refresh your package list without updating your system. This is going to lead to a partial upgrade. You will install a package that is newer than the packages on your system. This is explicitly warned against on the Arch Wiki, which is funny because various points throughout the book, it actually does link to the Arch Wiki. When installing packages in Arch, avoid refreshing the package list without upgrading the system. For example, when a package is no longer found in the official repositories. In practice, do not run pacman capital S Y instead of pacman capital S Y U, as this could lead to dependency issues. On page 109, they talk about the general flow of compiling an application and mention that it's fairly common for there to be a configure file in a repo to configure your environment. And I'm sure this exists in some cases, but this is not a common thing. It just happened to exist in the HTOP repo they were compiling. I have personally never seen it myself. On page 155, it talks about how slash bin slash sh is commonly not linked to bash. It's often linked to a more minimal shell. This is true in a sense. There are a lot of distros that use dash instead. However, a lot of other distros, especially if you go a couple years back, Instead, use bash in its POSIX mode. On page 154, when talking about shebangs and script files, it says, possibly one of the dumbest things I have ever seen written down. The operating system, often called the kernel in Linux. No. No, it's not often called the kernel. The kernel is the kernel. The kernel, plus all of this user space tooling, that is the operating system. On page 192, when talking about git and talking about pull requests, it says there is no native git word for a pull request. You have different platforms like GitHub that use pull requests and GitLab that use merge request. This, that part, true. The fact that there is no native git word for a pull request is completely false. Torvalds has had giant arguments with GitHub because they didn't implement the native git 
pull request. That is a big part of the reason why he doesn't like GitHub. If you don't believe that these exist, here are the Git docs for them. Git request pull generates a summary of pending changes. I also had some fairly minor disagreements, but these aren't blatantly wrong. On page 76 and 77, it talks about using Vim and how to learn Vim. It says don't use your arrow keys, don't use your mouse, don't use GVim, and be very careful about using plugins. And I understand what it's getting at here, but I think it's very dependent on what you're trying to get out of Vim. Are you trying to be the primogen and know a thousand different ways of using Vim, or do you like the general core concepts of Vim and then want to build up from there whilst you have a working development environment. I don't know which is the correct way to do it. I know that going the primogen's route of just diving headfirst is going to get you a lot more knowledge, but you might not end up needing that knowledge in the first place. So it really depends. On page 103, it talks about installing applications with a package manager and says these install things as one neat little bundle and says this should be familiar if you've used EXEs on Windows or DMGs on macOS. No, it shouldn't feel familiar because on Windows you often have extra wizards to use and you typically just drag and drop the file. You don't just run a command. Like, it's a completely different system. Maybe it'll feel familiar if you've used a software store before, but not just using EXEs. With all that being said, I do think most of the book is really good content, but it is very clear to me that the publisher did not edit the technicals of this book and just let the authors write whatever they wanted to write. Most of the book is grammatically fine, besides that one part where it mentioned the chapter that hadn't happened yet. That's the only part where the publisher absolutely should have picked it up. But I've read the glass door reviews for this company, and this is not a one-off situation. This seems to be the case for a lot of the books coming out of Pact Publishing. Also, all of the information in this book is out there for free on places like the Arch Wiki. So, honestly, it's hard for me to recommend this book, really. Like, if you get it on sale, I guess it's not a bad buy, but, like, I probably wouldn't go out of my way to buy it. So then, let me know your thoughts down below. Do you happen to own this book or happen to own another pack publishing book and feel a similar way? I would love to know. And I know there is Jay LaCroix's book and that book apparently is really good. I have not read it though. So if you want to go read it, uh, go check it out. Uh, anyway, if you like the video, go like the video. If you really like the video and you want to become one of these amazing people over here, check out the Patreon, subscribe, silly bear, pay linked in the description down below. That's going to be it for me and... I have a feeling that they might not send me a book again.